Um, thanks, Sam. And uh, I, I don't know. I wrote it, but I'm not very good at reading Office script, so maybe I'll kind of do my best to kind of go back and forth and talk. Um, it's a privilege to be here, um, and, and uh, it's also a little, tr uh, it's a little, creates a little fear and trembling, if I'm honest, because uh, presenting in front of my colleagues, and I have not been, I've thought about things, but I've done more things than written about things, if that makes sense. I haven't been the greatest scholar since being here. I get immersed in the administrative stuff that has to happen and teaching, and so I don't write very often. Um, so I'm grateful that Sam actually made me have a deadline that I at least could put a draft of something together. But now that it's together, I think about, oh, man, there's so many different ways I should go, and it's not really great either direction, but it is something that I think is fun and has some possibilities. So to actually, once you get a draft, it's easier to kind of change that draft. So I, I thank you for that time. I also actually wanted to at least call out and, and sort of um, dedicate this presentation to... Um, a woman named Anita Lacey, or in, in, in memory of Anita Lacey, she passed away on Sunday. Um, but Anita was the mother of one of my friends in middle school. And, um, and she, uh, she happens to be African American. It was the first African American house I ever went to. And somehow I think, and I do say this, I think I invited myself to barbecue at her house. And um, her, th their family actually did a great barbecue spread, and I went there, and um, when I saw that she had passed away on Sunday, I thought it, it'd just be appropriate to kind of at least call her out and thank her for being a bridge builder in my life. So, I, actually when Sam asked me to do this, I felt like it was a theme that was kind of connected to the Wiley Lecture, so I thought, well, it's better be good to at least think about and read something that the guy in the Wiley Lectures actually is doing. So I did. And I actually hit his book, The Death of Race, is a really nice little book, fast read. Um, and he starts out, we are all participating in the story of race. Um, it, it, it shapes who we are. It's, it's everywhere. And it's how we see others and it's how we see ourselves. So in many ways, um, to keep in that spirit and then the spirit of the book, which is sort of a narrative, um, I decided to kind of at least start the, the, the kind of conversation in that vein. Um, because uh, it wasn't until I came here and I was teaching a race and ethnicity class that it struck me how much this idea of the narrative of how much part of my life was shaped by this concept that we just find ourselves in. We, we, you know, I didn't pick the race. I didn't pick the place I was born. I just, I happened to be born white and middle class or working class in the city of Philadelphia. So uh, as part of that story, um, this is a story of race. Um, and, and I use that picture. I, I actually originally thought, oh, I wanted a little different picture. Um, but that's actually me, and that's my dad. Um, and if you look, what you can see is that there are two doors right next to each other. You can see the proximity of those doors. For me, those doors and that little alley, that little thing, uh, is an important place for the shaping and the beginning of the understanding of race. Because actually, it's, it's either my first or second. It's one of my earliest, absolutely one of my earliest memories in my entire life took place on those steps. You see, um, my father had invited his friend, Jimmy Groves, to the house for a barbecue. Or, or actually, it would be grilling or a cookout because I lived in the South long enough to know that barbecue has a specific meaning, and this was not a barbecue. Um, it was a cookout. Now, Jimmy Groves lived in an adjacent town, but Jimmy Groves happened to be black. My dad didn't know Jimmy Groves from home. He met Jimmy Groves when he was in the Army somewhere in Texas, and they happened to be from the same community. So sometime between 19, I'm going to say 1969 and 1971, because I don't remember how old I was. I remember I was either on, I was either actually in the, that doorway, or I kind of think, as I remember, I came around from the backyard, and my next door neighbor who lives in this house, his name Jack Allen, was holding a maroon-handled flat-tip screwdriver to my father's throat, and they were arguing. And they were arguing because my father had invited 
a black man to our house for a cookout. I was a little kid. It is, it sticks in my head. I don't remember exactly what my father said, although he was not, my mom would have never cussed or anything. She, he was not the saved and sanctified Nazarene guy. He was kind of more a guy from the neighborhood who would duke it out. And I do, with the, the essence I do remember, he says, I will invite whoever I please to my house. He might have used some cuss words. I actually don't remember those, but I do remember, I will invite whoever I want to my house, and you won't tell me. So that, that's the first memory of race that I had. Part of this becomes really ironic because in later years, let me say, uh, actually, when I start to look at this, um, I have to think about the notion of Jim Crow and segregation as I think about race. You see, because that little town where Jimmy Grove came from and my town, my town's called Collingdale, it was Pennsylvania, it was, a, it was an edge suburb in the city of Philadelphia, Darby Township abutted it. Collingdale was an all-white suburb. Darby Township was an all-black suburb. And what happened is, and then there was another town next to us called Sharon Hill, and our, that was an all-white suburb. And eventually, we were told we had to merge schools. So when we think about this, we have to think about Jim Crow, purity, and eating laws, and what that means, and the notion of segregation and keeping people separate, and keeping them kind of, you know, kind of imprisoned to notions. Because in all honesty, the issue of race was used to keep us from being together, even though we had more common interests in terms of economic standing, sociologically. Our economic standing should have united us in common goals, but our race divided us. And so, what we see is that, that within this context of Jim Crow, schools were segregated. And somewhere, well, actually in 1971, we have a, a, you know, a historical event, Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg, that says, hey, by the way, you have to implement and integrate uh, the schools. You have to implement Brown versus the Board of Education, because while Brown said, can't have separate but equal, it never said you had to do anything about it. Finally, Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg said you did. So I have my parents, who want, at one level taught me about race, my dad, who was willing to stand up for the right to have whoever he wanted into, into his house, and at the same time saying, oh my gosh, I don't want you to integrate. In fact, you know, the code word, what we know now is a code word, we need to think about sending them to the Christian Academy, right? There's a whole series of scholarship about Christian academies not being about the faith, but being about institutions of segregation and preservation of whiteness. So all of a sudden, these things come up. My parents weren't really, really active in, in fighting it. I don't remember them ever marching. We never had ser incidences like existed in, in Boston, but it, in terms of rocking of buses and things like that. Um, but they were concerned about the integration. The same people who stood up for bringing somebody that we would go to school together didn't want us to go to school together. Uh, like, it's a strange paradox, this thing of race in, in the United States. Um, it is a very interesting thing to talk about. And one of the, uh, as I actually have this written, so I, I don't have a slide of the right quote, but um, Bentham actually notes, race is a simple story told to describe an intricate world. So while I learned this great lesson, I see my dad standing up for this thing. My dad is a complex human being who could be an, e like he would use crazy racial epithets and mostly more ethnic, actually, truthfully. Uh, in, my, in Philadelphia, it was a bunch of different ethnic groups coming around. So there would be all these different things, but they could be his best friend. And he would use these words that I wouldn't actually necessarily speak even today, right? And they're friends. And you're saying, how does this work? How, how does this play out? But that's the notion of what we saw and in the house, at least, that I was raised in, that as a result, eventually, goes on a path of figuring out how do we bring people together. I will say, actually, this is a Woolworth sit-in, and I threw the picture of the Woolworth in there because when I moved to North Carolina from L.A., they closed that Woolworth, and I had to go and see it. Actually, I have pictures of the lunch counter, but it was boarded up. Um, and I couldn't find them. So um, that was the original Woolworths in Greensboro that they, one of the first sit-ins occurred. So 
The complexity actually sociologically continues to exist in our country. We aren't moving, in fact, we are moving further apart on many issues than we are coming together. So I'll use a couple of data points and charts and stuff for a little bit. Not that I collect it, but that we use, from, that the Pew collect it. And what you start to see is this change in attitudes, and, and this is done by political party, divides. But if we look at political party, political party, I would argue, can serve as a proxy for race in some ways. Because about, uh, I think it's 85% of uh, African Americans are Democrat. 65% of Asians, which I found surprising actually, are Democrats, affiliate with the Democratic Party. And uh, about 63% of Latinos affiliate with the Democratic Party. So most of the diversity in the country affiliate with the Democratic Party. So I think it can function as a reasonable proxy for race. While not perfect, at least one that we can look at. And so what we see is we see these trends of the real issue is the trends in the, big, the, the divide, the gap between values and ideas. So this is specifically, this chart here is specifically the chart on race. And the question that was asked, and this is in 2017, of about a, a sample of about 2,500 people, um, it said blacks uh, who can't get ahead in this country are mostly responsible for their own condition. And, and what we see is this big trend. The Democrats, or the, P, the mixed group, tends to see that not as the case, but we see a growing gap between Democrats and Republicans. And again, I think we can say it's a, a proxy or a racial divide. The other one for me that gets really concerning is up here is that poor people, once again, um, and the question is poor people have it easy because they can get government benefits without doing anything in return. And we see a pretty significant gap, which, which raises questions for me sociologically and theologically, if I'm honest. So the next chart. And this is more a chart just to show the changes in terms of commonality. When we look at party differences in 1994, if we look at the dark central purple section, there's a lot of commonality. If we look in 2004, still a fair amount, a lot of commonality. If we look in 2017, there is a chasm. What we see is that ideological values, understandings, uh, a sense of what people believe, think, um, are growing farther and farther apart. And that poses a significant question, at least to me, uh, uh, as to what we should do and how we should address that. Another pew chart. We see discrimination as a factor of getting ahead. And again, we see that stark gap of that people who would identify as being more democratic-leaning tend to think discrimination is a factor. It inhibits people's progress, whereas others don't. In a more recent study, actually, from the uh, PRRI, PRRI, the, the uh, Public Religion and Re uh, Research Institute, we start to see frequency of contact. Because one of the things that happens, uh, Gordon Allport in his 1952 book uh, about prejudice starts to talk about, as long as we don't have contact or interaction with other people, notions of prejudice can continue to grow and develop. They don't need to be verified, validated, challenged, looked at. We can just have half-truths and put them in their place. And so without interacting with people, without looking at people who are different, inevitably the gaps, the chasms between different groups are going to continue to grow. This shows, uh, this was actually done uh, two months ago. So that's a really nice recent survey, uh, February of 2019. And what we start to see is this is contact um, with people uh, from, other, from other backgrounds. So at least... At least 62% of the people who responded to this survey, and, and it was about a sample of a little better than 1,073, I think it was, uh, we see that they at least contact with people from different races and ethnicity once a week. What is well, that's a really good question. And it just says, do you interact with them? It could be in your work. So it, it's just contact in any sort. Now, 
So the question about what does contact mean and how do we define contact? Because the kind, the intensity, the frequency of the contact that we have with other people, again, tends to be important if we determine it, if we, if we look at it in terms of uh, building better and healthier bridges. Does that make sense? So this is just general contact, and I have not done the numbers and ran the statistics. So we see that some contact. Again, we see 60% of people kind of come up with people of other religions. And the question is, what other religion? What does that mean? Does that mean Catholic? Does that mean Muslim? Does that mean something else? We see 57% per, uh, of the people, different political party, and then 41% on sexual orientation, at least, that are reporting that. So we see that there is at least a, min a, minimum, of, you know, a minimum amount of contact. Um, so there, there's something going on there. Now this chart talks about locations and how they interact, of the interaction. And it's really it's kind of hard to see. The most of them interact with race and ethnicity at work. The top is work. The second is friendship circles. The third is at a school and family at civic gatherings, such as PTA. For me, this one's the one that's kind of the sad one, at religious services. Only 14% report their interactions with people who are different happens in a religious service. And then at school, even maybe worse, 7% at schools. But it shows the, the nature and kind of the idea, once again, of the segregation of the community. If only 7% of people from difference you find in your school, it shows that we really are not, there's a high degree of residential segregation that people aren't mixing uh, in such a way that we need, to, we need to seriously question how do we, I, well, I would argue we need to seriously question how do we help people mix more or at least get to know other people. So we look at religious diversity. Um, we start to see, actually, um, this is, again, by political affiliation, that uh, the majority, or 54% of Democrats, so the majority, you know, prefer you know, some sort of religious diversity, um, whereas 12% of Republicans, somewhere in the middle, you know, like we're kind of neither or, we see that shift. And then 40% um, of people who identify in this survey as being Republican really would prefer a Christian majority. Uh, you know, I, there's all kinds of ways to interpret that, and, um, but it is an interesting fact that, that we're not looking towards um, into, you know, kind of being around people who are different. Once again, this is race and ethnicity or some sort of diversity. Um, mostly prefer ethnically diverse country. So we see 65% somewhere in the middle, and then 13%. So this is a little less, a little less strong uh, in terms of, of, of feelings or response rates um, when, we, when we see them. Uh, this is what institutions are helping unify people, what are bringing people together. And the blue are those that are bringing people together. And the clear winner are community nonprofits. The media is not, politics isn't, religion is not doing so hot. They're second to last. And then you see colleges, universities, public schools, the military does so-so. But in general, there's not a lot of institutions that are like really working to, to unify people, to bring people together. Um, and in a divided country, it's, it seems to me, you know, we need to figure out, once again, how do we go about doing that? So... This is, a, this is, again, the PRRI survey. And it kind of looks at places that, keep, that people have things uh, that agree on. So it's really interesting that if you look, that everybody agrees on protecting health care coverage at the top. So health care reform is not a good idea, right, right now, if you're kind of <laughs> thinking about that. Um, you know, drug treatment, we start to see some, we see some agreement. But down here is changing the Constitution to prevent children who are born in the United States uh, to non-U.S. citizens from automatically being granted American citizenship. So we see, again, this divide uh, going on here. And as you go over, it means you, you support that statement and, uh, more. 
So, but there are some things that people agree on, and as we look at younger people, younger people agree more and more on things as compared to older people. So there are some trends going on here. So the question becomes, you know, what do we do to build a bridge that spans the chasm of difference that seems so kind of embedded in our society today? Um, and that kind of brings me back to my story. Um, I started out with my friend, uh, Phil Lacey. So I'll, I'll go here. Um, this, I took this off a different friend of mine's uh, like Facebook page. But uh, one of the things is, when my parents fought the integration of the schools, um, and yet the schools integrated, the leaders of the school decided the best thing to do would be to have, or one of the good things to do, is to have the students meet together regularly and figure out what's the plan they're going to have to help the schools integrate. So sometime around middle school, I'm not exactly sure when, fifth grade, sixth grade, something like that, uh, I was selected. All of a sudden, I was told, you're going to these meetings. It was a good deal for us. We, didn't, we got to skip out of school. We got to go to meetings, got fed, and got to hang out with other people and figure out, what do we do? How are we going to... Um, overcome the differences that we experience. And so as kids, we met together, we, hang out, we hung out, and we came up with ideas and plans. Um, and uh, it was along that time that all of a sudden, when I was in eighth grade, kids in seventh grade, we started to have an integrated school. Kids from the African American, actually the kids from the African American schools were sent to the, to the all white schools. Uh, this is from my junior year when we finally came fully together. Uh, I like this picture because this picture was in the Philadelphia Inquirer, and it was the preseason preview. And in that preseason preview, the thing I really, uh, that kind of I like about it is that preseason preview wrote that there's no way that our school, the Academy Park, at the time Fighting night, we're still the Fighting Knights, I guess, uh, could come together because they couldn't overcome racial issues. They were, un un we would be unable. So the Inquirer put it in the newspaper, that picture is from that article, because I don't think I have it, but my friend Ed Miller put it up, so I thought I'd, I'd take it. So said we couldn't do it. So uh, one thing that Allport says that helps people come together uh, through contact is to have common goals by which to work at, to achieve, and to have relatively equal status. So in this, we were all equal, basically. We had a common goal. It was a crazy talented team. In fact, the first 32 guys had been, the year before, at least honorable mention all league from our respective different teams. And the newspaper said we couldn't do it. So Miller puts this clip up too, and it's after our very first game. So somehow, as 15, 16, 17-year-old kids, we decided we were gonna work together. And what we decided we would do, our coach was a little crazy, He's a very good coach. In fact, his last big job was the University of Illinois. Um, he was the head coach for a while. Uh, uh, where is that? That's him right there, Bill Cuban. So there was actually a couple years ago, there was an article uh, in the New York Times talking about this whole thing and Cuban's ascendancy to the head football coaching job at Illinois, which was in scandal at the time. So it was kind of fun to see. But so Cuban always made us walk out in two single file lines and somehow, as 15 and 16 year olds, we decided we were gonna hold hands, black and white, one another, and walk out. As we walked out, people ridiculed us. People called us gay. People threw all kinds of stuff at our name, every name you can think of as we walked out. The beauty of that whole image, I mean, when, when Remember the Titans came out, all of a sudden all, all my friends like, hey, that's like us, no way. <laughs> um, and it's like, uh, you know, but with the beauty of it, I, I couldn't, it couldn't have been more po poetic. The first kick, the kickoff goes, we have to kick off to Marple Newtown, who's like heavily favored over us. On the very first play, Brian Bartoff, a backup tight end, makes a hit that causes a fumble. Bartoff is white. Harold Strong, Another backup tight end, this African American, is running next to him and picks it up and runs it in for a touchdown. I think we won like 45 to 6, something like that. Um, and 
And so the notion that when people are invested in working together, communicating with one another towards common goals, as Allport suggests, you can be successful. You can break down the divisions that divide. And so really, I actually, I didn't have a picture of my eighth grade, I, I don't have my eighth grade yearbook, I don't know where that's at. Um, and so I was gonna put my friend Felacy up there, but so I just had to steal it from my friend Ed Miller. But when we work together, when we listen to each other, when we have equal status and we see each other with equal status, we can do kind of amazing things. Which brings me a little bit to food, and I had this other slide. This is, uh, this, is Ed, this is Ed Mitchell. So John Shelton Reed is a kind of a famous sociologist of the South. Like, he's really like this preeminent sociologist of the South. And um, as soon as he retired, he wrote this book, Holy Smoke, the complete book of Southern Barbecue. And um, one of the things that he has in here is Ed Mitchell, who's actually been on TV a fair amount, talking about why he likes cooking barbecue. Because there's a couple of places that in North Carolina that said, actually, people were brought together by, and the first places that got quickly integrated were the barbecue restaurants. This place, Hersey's in Burlington, has a sign up. I, I never took it. Well, I didn't have phones to take a picture at the time when I was there last time. Um, or else I would have taken a picture. But it says, this was the first integrated place in Burlington because of the barbecue. But it says, I like cooking barbecue because this way, because it's something to hold on to that hasn't been tarnished yet. It allows all of us to interact. Barbecue was the one of the things that held the tension down during the race movement in the 1960s. When there was a barbecue, it did not matter who you were. The only thing that could settle an issue would be having a pig picking. It is a feasting time, a festive time. Nobody's upset or mad and there's no other dish that powerful. He goes on to say, I'm not exactly sure why that's so powerful, but I kind of like to liken it to the, to the fattened calf and the prodigal son. Because when you're having a party, you can't be mad at each other. So um, that, that notion actually becomes very formative to much of my work, really practically, and I've had an intellectual interest in it as well. So there, were, there was always room at the table. So this is actually, my house that I grew up in is really small. I didn't realize how small it was until I went in there this summer. Uh, I was like, oh my gosh, this house was so small. Um, but that's a picture. My mom actually always had a place at the table for anybody. So this is actually a Christmas Eve meal of some sort, some year. And Around that table, we have a world-renowned, actually, pediatric researcher from, he was at the University of Pennsylvania. He was from Wuhan, China, Wen Shi Ho. Uh, he happened, my sister got to meet him, started to come to our church, so he came to dinner all the time. The guy who has his finger out, his name, I don't know his last name. His name is Eugene. He is another world-renowned uh, MRI researcher from Russia, again, who happened to kind of come to the University of Pennsylvania. Somehow we met him, started to come to dinner every Sunday. Uh, over the course of my life, you know, Swaziland, I tend to consider as like a Nazarene protectorate of sort. It's no longer called Swaziland. But this guy, Hugh Magagula, shows up at my church. And Hugh Magagula happened to be the secretary of education for Swaziland. He was getting a master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania. So where did he eat dinner every Sunday? At my house. Um, so somehow my mom, I think it's rooted in the tradition of the love feast from really an Anabaptist heritage that kind of, kind of runs through the Lucas side, this German side of my family. Everybody's welcome in my family. And that was just the way it was. People came for dinner, whoever was there, my friends show up, they could eat, they hung around. So as part of that table fellowship as a Eucharistic kind of sense of love feast is kind of woven in to how I have kind of always viewed how we should approach building bridges across boundaries and bonds. So, um, so actually, if I, I have to confess that my seminary education was actually rooted in, I think there, I, I wrote about two things a lot, table fellowship and the fact that the, I think the New Testament is everything spoken to Pharisees because I'm a Pharisee. Because those of us who read the book and take it seriously, we've fallen to all the traps that Pharisees do. That's what at least I thought I did. 
But so this becomes part of what we do. I actually don't, I can't find any pictures other like from Raleigh. As a regular part of, I did, actually, I can't say that. Ron, I have some pictures of you dedicating Zoe at our church, but I don't have any actual meal pictures. Um, so this was just a birthday celebration at my house, which we kind of did regularly. And kids would just come over to eat. I, I, I used to have a bunch of kids every Thursday night would come over to eat uh, at our house um, to, uh, well, actually, this kid, Larry, he just wanted to learn words. He just wanted to debate. He had been a screw-up his whole life um, in terms of school. Uh, comes junior year, starts coming to our church, starts to become a part of the community, comes to dinner, loves words. The recommendation he got from his math teacher uh, his senior year, because he went from a 1.9 to something like a 3.5, and saying, I don't know what happened to this kid, but something's different. Um, Larry would come, he's at six foot nine. We had measuring things all over our house from him. He measured himself every week. Uh, became an All-American Division III basketball player. Uh, had he not been, if had he been eligible and not injured, he would have played at a higher level. But table fellowship becomes this place in which we can build bridges and how we go about doing things. The other thing that I think is really important about table fellowship um, is this idea that when we get into intimate conversations, it requires us to hear and listen to the truth. We can no longer be blind to the situations that we see. And so Michael Eric Dyson, in his book this summer called What Truth Sounds Like, writes, policy at that point was a refuge from the truth. And he's talking about uh, a dinner with Bobby Kennedy and James Baldwin and some other people where he said, witness, where people had to tell their witness of what they really experienced, witness exposes the unspoken claims of whiteness. It's privileged, hi- uh, it's privileged to hide its ability to deflect black suffering into con- comparatively sterile discussions of policymaking that take the heat off of me and put it onto that. So when we start to talk about abstractions, it takes... It, moves us away. But when we really listen to people's suffering, it sort of begins to change how we think. Now, Ron, I don't know if you can ever help me out, because I I read this one time. I didn't write it down, so it really bums me out. These guys, Dudley and Rosen, who are sociologists of religion at Hartford, at the Hartford Institute, once wrote that evangelicals, one of the problems sociologically with evangelicals and conservative Christians is that we are anti-structuralist by nature. We do not see the structural problems. We are, we are individualists. We look at individual interactions. And they wrote that evangelicals become structuralists when they have a personal encounter, when they see, can see the structures through another person. Something to that effect. That's not a direct quote. but uh, And I, I can't, I'll give them their names. I had no idea where they wrote it. Uh, but I read it somewhere, and I find that interesting. When we eat and listen to the truth from other people, it opens our eyes to the systems and structures that keep them imprisoned or that we can see another side of the situation. And so we've considered it important. So, um, so this kind of goes to some of the work. I, Sam invited me because I think on my Vita, I've been training a lot. I've done a lot of training, a lot of interaction stuff, and I don't know that I put this on my Vita, in City Heights, because that's where we live. And City Heights is one of the most diverse places in the city. Uh, and a few years back, we were really, Becky, Becky well, the truth is, Sara Abdi, who is a leader, a leader of the, in the United Women of East Africa, somehow said, hey, um, we were thinking about moving, actually. And she said, what does Kevin like to do? Uh, we want to keep you guys here. We think you guys are important bridge people. And so she, 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 Becky said, well, you know, he likes clergy people and he likes this kind of stuff. And so all of a sudden we started this group at, at Becky and Sarah's behest and then they threw me as the leader uh, with uh, a bunch of people uh, who were trying, we could tell the trend that was going on and we were trying to build relationships amongst people who were different in City Heights because we knew the, the tone of the election and things were going in such a way that it didn't look promising for a lot of people, or it looked risky for a lot of people. Uh, And so as a result, uh, we held a couple iftars. We did a variety of things. And uh, this was a place that we could do, I think a lot of, there was a place for some rich research. So we had all kinds of people who showed up 
for these meals that we could start to get to know each other. And it really kind of comes out of the community classroom meal where we always kind of like, Sarah would be like, my women's favorite day is when they interact with your students and they get to make some boosts together. They love doing that. And so the goal at some point is to try to create some boundary spanning, some bridge building between the different cultures in the community by sharing food. Peaceful is here. And uh, I know she works with um, a, a group of people who have done significant partnership. Dante Dawes and their people at UPAC have done some work this summer uh, in, in a similar vein. Um, but not many people were there. I got wet, and it was good food. So I, I would say uh, it's worth doing. But what we see is that when we start to think sociologically uh, about food, food is about identity. Food is about intimacy. Food is something that people bring uniquely from where they're from. And anthropologists say that this is one way that they can recreate a memory of home. It creates memories. And if we're willing to enter in to their space, we can learn a lot. As I was telling Peaceful, but I didn't have the right picture to download, one thing that I've learned in the last couple of years from the Korean community is this beautiful porridge kind of stew that they make that they, that they use as a, as, as a means of thanksgiving. Uh, because of that's how they view God had sustained them while they were living in the forest when they were running from the, the uh, ethnic Burmese in Burma trying to get to the refugee camps. Um, and it's a powerful story to hear. And then I was at a birthday party like two weeks ago, and they were talking about in the refugee camps eating salt and rice and being grateful. And you, and you, start, to, you start to also think about your own privilege and your own location and how can we be agents of change and transformation. So, I think eating together, and uh, I have a bunch of different quotes in the written part, but I just don't read that well, uh, at least in public. Uh, I think it's incarnational. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Choosing, to be, uh, choosing the freedom, this is Bentham again, choosing the freedom to love someone other than, our, than us requires us to be in places where our lives intersect with others to truly love the other. We must go to where they are, displace ourselves without pretense or expectations. We try to understand their perspective. In many ways, this is the model of, that we see as Christians. So when we move to theological kind of places, we need to be willing to go to places that other places where God did not consider equality with God to be grasped, but took on the form of a slave. And so again, if we are to try to be followers of that God, Jesus, then we need to start to think about how do we displace ourselves and find that. Now, there is this debate about displacement, right? Displacement uh, you know, begins with a, a, the assumption of privilege. Um, but in many ways, we can kind of shift it to say, maybe, so I think privileged people can displace themselves, but sometimes we can put our places where we feel a little uncomfortable, where we're not the, the, the dominant person, where we're, so sometimes it's going to a person who's just different and trying their, you know, their food, their place, their experience. Um, Norman Wurzba, who's like an agrarian theologian, I would call him, he's at Duke, uh, kind of writes, eating is the daily reminder and opportunity for us to join with creation in ways that will further God's life, giving ways. Uh, I think when we start to realize that actually this can become a Eucharistic, the love feast um, as a Eucharistic interaction, we can start to see transformation happen, especially if we have a degree of radical hospitality. This is Randy Maddox kind of talking about actually the Eucharist. And he says, the Lord's Supper conveys power for our sin-distorted lives. It also plays an important role in shaping that transformation. To understand this role, we need to simply note that communion is not an isolated act. It takes place within a liturgical framework. A central aspect of lit liturgy is guided reflection on the confession of our sins. The value of this re repeated exercise for deepening our awareness of motivation, prejudice, practices that remain in need of healing should be obvious. It is that part of the passing of the peace, of coming together, of realizing how we have things that are broken in our lives that can be transformational and bridge building in all kinds of ways. Uh, and uh, I find it interesting. So actually, we don't really need to look at that picture. But I, I'm going um, to end at least kind of how contact and hanging out with people changes people. Um, my dad, who I started the picture with, this is my dad now. He's, what, he's 80. He'll be 80. 
how old I'll be 83 this year, uh, and my next door neighbor, Lorena. Um, this is last summer at her house. My dad actually has, he actually has OCD, and he's very much a clean freak. He, he will not eat food in any place, but he loves Lorena. When we first moved here, he was always concerned, what do you think about undocumented people? Well, when he realized Lorena is undocumented, it changed how he started to look at things. Now, he, now he's frustrated at things that kind of impede undocumented people. Uh, we went over her house at Dorian Zoe's because my dad was there and she was excited that he was there. She loves him too. And she just made all kinds of food. And my dad, who literally at potlucks would only eat food that we brought, ate all kinds of food from Lorena. A few days later, we went to our friend Amar and Layla's house who are Syrian refugees who live in City Heights. And once again, my dad ate a boatload of Syrian food which to me is an image of transformation through contact. There are structural, there's structural critiques. This is very much an individual kind of a smaller micro level intervention that when we get together, but it's when we know the people, it can allow us to work on the structural issues to, to start to bring about the change and transformation that it seems like is necessary in a culture that is increasingly divided. Thank you. <laughs>